All right, so today I'm going to go over a video that was a, a comment from one of y'all uh, asking to kind of just review narrowband processing uh, in general and um, and kind of walk through the, the steps of what I do as I'm processing a narrowband image. So I have, you know, three uh, narrowband uh, images that I took of the Crab Nebula. I've got an HA, um, this one's O3, and then S2. And these are just the, the stacks uh, that have come out. Um, as you can tell, I think probably my flats weren't, you know, exactly great. So it's not the best data in the world, but luckily it's a, it's a pretty small target. So, um, so I'm actually going to be able to crop this in a lot, uh, you know, as we go through here, um, and and see what we can get out of it. So, start off with let's let's you know take a look at this. I what I do is I will save process icons of my most commonly used processes, and then uh, once I've done that, I can just kind of leave them here and I save save them off so I can kind of load them up and they're in the order that I typically use them in. And the, the way that you can do that for yourself is let's say you've got a, a process like um, background neutralization, for example. You can take that process and at any point in time, you can just grab the little triangle and put it down here and now you've got a process icon. Right click on it and you can set the identifier. So let's say that we're gonna call it BGN for background neutralization, just something friendly. Now I already have one there, so I'll call it BGN2. And now you've got a process icon. You, know, you drag that over to the side here, that kind of thing. And then when you wanna save them, you just highlight all of them you know, by dragging across there. Go up to process, process icons, and then you can say save those process icons. And that'll create this little XPSM file, right? Uh, you just pick a place to save it. And then as you can see, I've had a couple of these uh, that I've had in here. Um, and you know, once you've got it saved, then you can reload it. And that really makes it great for having your most commonly used things. You know, there's certainly other things that I will go into individually, but this way I don't have to hunt and peck through them. The other nice thing is, is let's say you have some defaults uh, that you work on, like um, for example, with my noise reduction, if you have some some values that are kind of your go-to original values, you can punch them in here, and then when you save that icon, it'll save those values in there. So you're not starting off the way you would if you were to come in and pull up that uh, multi-scale linear transform, um, where sometimes you're starting at zero, that kind of thing. So at any rate, um, so we've got this here. Let me blow it up. I normally like working with it on the blown up size. Uh, that's why I got the big monitor and that kind of thing. Uh, but sometimes if you've got a bunch of windows open, you just hit the little double box guy here to have it a little bit smaller so you can see more than one thing. Uh, but for right now, let's start with it big. And I'm going to start, normally want to have the screen transfer function open. Um, you know, it does the same thing that using the button up here does, but having it here allows you that's what you're going to use when you're stretching and that kind of thing. But also, a lot of times I will like doing the little arrow here and dragging it around to get a little bit more realistic stretch on what I'm going to try to do. But we'll do that to start off with. Then the next one is my dynamic crop. So bring this up, and it's by default giving me a little box here. I'm just going to go ahead and, and kind of resize that box to start with. You go up to the edges and when you have the little kind of like Lego bricks sticking out from the side, oops, control Z is your friend, um, you know, you can do that. Or if you reset it, you can actually just drag a box to start and then resize it from there. So I really want to just kind of crop off these edges that are weird here. Normally, if I'm dealing with a larger one, I'm really just trying to crop off the ragged stuff at the bottom. But in this case, I want to try to be a little bit more focused in on the target itself. It gives me a nice center point of where that image is. So I think that's pretty good. I'll hit the green check to make that happen. And I can kind of hit my button again for it to, to resize it for the window. And then I want to do the same thing apply that same crop to both of these. That's where the History Explorer is great 
because now I can pull up that image that I had and it has all the settings of that process right there. So I can actually just drag it over here and it'll apply the exact same crop to both of those. And then I can go ahead and close my dynamic crop. And then a good, good thing to just kind of double check it sometimes is just drag one window on top of the other and then just click in on the, uh, on the little title bar here and it'll kind of give you a merged overlay of the two so I can make what I'm looking for is to make sure that I'm not seeing something like this where my stars and everything are doubled that would tell me oops the crop didn't apply right or the images aren't aligned uh, properly that kind of thing but in this case that one looks good and then doing the same thing on this one let me get this guy out of the way same thing on this one yep image is good so everything's aligned pretty well a um, couple things that I can tell in this image right away um, when I'm looking at this here it may be kind of hard for you to see but I can see what feels like some kind of streaking or raining in the noise here and that tells me I probably didn't have good enough dithering uh, going on dithering is really what helps with what's called this walking noise um, Luckily, it seems to be at a pretty low level. So I don't really think it's gonna Affect my overall image that much. So, you know, but you know once again, this is not a perfect set of images It's what I've got to work with. So that's what we're gonna mess with here today so once again, I, I normally kind of come back and start with the HA, uh, you know, and, and really to, to take a look at it, see if it looks like things are looking pretty good, because that's normally my best detailed data source. And yeah, things things are looking all right there. You know, I don't see any any major issues with that. I've cropped off the stuff that really looks bad. Um, so the first thing that I'm normally going to do is a background extraction at that point. Um, sometimes I'll combine the, the color channels to begin with, um, just to see what I've got. Um, but in this case, I, I think I want to start with the, the background extraction. So now luckily, this is a really easy target for background extraction because there's a, a planetary nebula here or a supernova remnant in this case um, you know there's just a lot of open space around it there isn't a lot of other nebulosity if you're dealing with a very large target that's filling your frame uh, the background extraction can you know get a little bit more difficult because you don't necessarily have a lot of just clear sky background uh, to point at but in my case I'll use DBE here just to, to kind of show it. Uh, in this case, an automatic background extraction probably would work just fine because it's the, the target, the structure in it is so obviously different than the background. The automatic process would pick that up without too much trouble. But, uh, but just to show for other ones here, I'll do the normal dynamic background. When you open it up, you wanna make sure you've got the crosshairs on here. If you don't have the crosshairs on here, that means you probably accidentally had one of the other images selected when you opened it up. So if you, you know, in this case, I'll do that. If I have one here, open it up, you can see I'm not getting the crosshairs. That means this is not gonna work on this image. It's gonna be doing everything over on this other one. So when you have that kind of thing happen, just close up, make sure you're selected then open up your DVE and you've got your crosshairs. Um, so first thing I wanna do here is the model parameters. I find on my camera, for some reason, this tolerance number just doesn't work. You know, it may be uh, nature of the CMOS or whatnot. It's just too low. So I'll normally bump this up to one, um, you know, so that it doesn't sit here and think that the background's too bright or too dark for it to try to, to do anything on. Um, model parameters, normally don't mess with at all sample generation so the default sample radius of 10 um, i normally go for something bigger i normally go for about 25 i like to have boxes that are big enough for me to be able to click on um, and you don't need to worry too much um, about it being a little bit bigger box and then samples per row normally seven is fine and you can add you know one or two as you need to you know uh, everything that i've i've heard is don't overdo it on the, the number of sample boxes. It really doesn't provide that big a benefit unless you have a really tough gradient that's easy to see. Um, there are a lot of cool things you can do in this to deal with like circular gradients and stuff. I'm not gonna go into that because honestly, I haven't learned it well enough. Um, but it is an interesting thing of how deep the actual uh, 
tool goes here. Model image, I don't normally mess with at all. And then target image correction. So um, subtraction versus division is going to be, are you going to be uh, dealing with something that's more vignetting or a gradient? Um, if you've done good flat correction, you're not going to have vignetting really that you're dealing with. So division is not normally what you're going to work with because that's for the, the vignetting. Subtraction is what you want when you have a, a gradient going across. Um, and it's about the math of whether or not it's a linear or kind of a, a curved fall off. Um, okay, so subtraction. Um, then get to these. I normally don't do normalize. Um, because it's not on by default, I don't find that I really need it. Uh, discard background model. If you're, especially when you're working with it, uh, I normally like seeing the background model. It lets me know if it's accidentally picking up part of my object. Um, and then replace target image. Um, kind of depends on how you want to do in your workflow. Um, sometimes I'll leave it on, sometimes I'll leave it off. Um, normally I will turn it off if I'm going to do something that, that I'll show you here um, just because I find it's it's kind of helpful um, but anyway so we'll take a look here at generating these samples so once I have all this in I want to go ahead and generate it and it's going to place the boxes there um, so first and foremost you want to make sure none of those boxes are sitting on your target uh, this one is really good because it's very defined. It doesn't have this kind of roll off like maybe a galaxy would where you kind of have that glow on the outside. Um, if it did, you'd want to just take the box and move it off or highlight the box and hit the X to delete it entirely um, to make sure that you're not going to do anything that is going to, to take over the image, um, take over an actual signal part of your image because then it'll it'll start subtracting signal, um, which is the opposite of what you want. So then you just start looking through here, and you can do it either by, you know, tabbing through at the top here and kind of looking at what's in each sample, um, or you can kind of eyeball it. With a bigger, bigger box, it's a little bit easier to eyeball it. But what you're wanting to try to make sure is that you don't have something like this happening, where it is a very large star dominating the sample. Um, because then that sample either becomes useless or worse, if your tolerance is too high, it's going to think the brightness of your star is background and it'll remove it. Um, you know, it'll, it'll think that whole part of the sky is that bright. Um, so in general, I'm just you know, doing a quick scan through to make sure none of these boxes look like they're sitting on a particularly large, bright star. Um, if there are stars in the box, like say this one, it's not necessarily that big a deal. You know, the vast majority of this, anything that's black, it's basically going to ignore in the model. So, you know, it's really looking for all this as the background. Um, so I can move this, it's not a problem to, it doesn't take a lot of time. But if you've got a lot of boxes or they're very small, you know, really it's just make sure that they're not dominated by a particular star. And that's all good. You can see, I didn't actually put a box here or here or here and it's probably because when it tried to do it in the model it was landing on a bunch of stars and went well that's a bad area of sky and just didn't do it um, so I'll add a couple of those in and then once you've got it you go ahead and run it and see what you get so hit this and typically before I look at the final image I'll take a look at the model so this one's the model here I think Oh no, I'm sorry, out of the stars. So let's look at the model here. And so this is the kind of gradient it comes up with. This is something I like, like to see in this kind of image, right? It shows something that looks relatively smooth going across here. Sometimes these can get pretty complex. But what I, what I don't want to see is where my signal area is here being highlighted out in the model. So what that would look like is, let's say I have a box right on the edge here. Now my tolerance is pretty high, so it's not, you know, most of those boxes are coming out kind of red. Um, so it's actually going to ignore those. But I've got a few here that it's not going to ignore. And if I run that model again, you can see the difference in the background. I've got this brighter, I think I've got a little bit of a brighter spot here. And you may not see too much difference in the final image. It may still look pretty good, but it is, you know, especially with a more diffuse nebula, it can really kill 
some of the nebulosity that you've got there. So you just want to be very cognizant of what you're what you're selecting. And luckily in this case you can see it just goes to black when it hits the actual part of the nebula. So that's why it didn't affect it too much. But if I had my tolerance turned up much, much higher, then that would start to become a legitimate problem. So just get rid of those. Felt pretty good about that, so I can run it here. Just double check that model one more time. Looks good. This looks good. And then this will become my kind of master HA. So I'm going to change its identifier to just HA. Scoot it over here into my holding area. All right, so now before I just close this out, um, I've created a, a good set of samples. They're not sitting on stars and all the rest of it, not sitting on the nebulosity. And I know my target is in each of the other areas is roughly the same size. So this should be the same in all of my images. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create that little process icon here. Cause you can only have dynamic running on one target at a time, right? So create the little process icon that's gonna save all the parameters that I've got here. And then I can go ahead and close this down. Then what I do is when I open up the next one and have it selected, double click that and boom, it comes up with all of my model parameters just the way I had it and each of these dots is already placed. So if you spend a lot of time getting this just right for frame one, then you can do it for frame two, three, four, you know, two or three, et cetera. Um, and so I can already tell there's a big, there's a gradient on this side going to that side. And so when I run the same thing, um, I should be able to see that pretty easily. So looking at the background, yep, there you can see that bright gradient going across there. So hopefully this one should look much flatter and it does. So that kind of big light area, there's still probably a little bit here. I could probably do it again and I probably will on the color combined, but it's a good first stab there. So this one will be my 03. And then I've still got my process icon there, so that's great. So I'll close this down, put them back, and then we'll do the exact same thing on the S2. And you can see how much quicker it makes it when you don't have to adjust those models over and over. All right, that looks like a pretty good gradient for what I would expect there. And my final on that looks pretty good. So for S2. And then we're done there. Um, now I'm still gonna leave this here because I may wanna run it one more time after I've done the color combine. So speaking of that, we'll go to color combine. That's the channel combination process. Super straightforward. You pick which one of these you want to be in each of the R, G, and B. The, the thing that gets, for some people, you know, is, is, is pretty straightforward. You figure out what the Hubble palette is because that's what a lot of the, the narrow band images that we see are, and you, you put it in the right thing. So Hubble palette is typically S, you know, the S2 and the R channel. And it goes SHO. So then the hydrogen would be in the green. You just want to make sure you're picking the right one. And then the oxygen in the blue. And then you go ahead and just run that. And you see what you get. And you get something that's kind of got a big cast on it, right? And that's really because there's different background intensity levels in these images. It's just based on filters being slightly different. Uh, one way you can kind of check what this would look like once all the colors are balanced is you unclick the little link icon here, hit it again, and then it'll go ahead and try to balance those colors for you. So this is the standard Hubble palette for the data that I have here. 
And I can tell I still got a little bit of a green cast here, um, that kind of thing. But what I'm really looking for in this is, am I getting unbalanced colors in my background to start with? You know, does it look particularly more green over here than over here, or more red here and more green over there? That would tell me I still have lingering gradients that would really benefit from another background extraction. Um, doesn't look like I do, but like I said, I do have a lot of kind of green cast in here. And so that's something that running background extraction can kind of help with one more time. So like if I link these again, you can see I kind of have this green blue. So that really means my HA and my O3 seem to be having some more signal than the S2 did in, uh, in the background level. So what I can do is I can open this up again, run it one more time. And now it's doing a color background extraction. And looking at it, you can see this is what it thinks was in there. And it's pretty flat, which is great, but it is kind of in that color cast. So it looks like that looked pretty good. So now I'm, I've still got the link on, right? But what does this image look like now? Have we done it again? And now it looks a lot closer to what this one looked like with the linking turned off, right? They look they look a lot more similar here. Still, you know, probably even a little bit more green in this one. Um, but once again, if I unlink those channels, I get it, and now they look virtually identical, right? So doing that background extraction one more time can be helpful, but it isn't necessary. 100%, right? I'm getting pretty close to the same exact thing uh, just by unlinking the channel there. So your mileage may vary. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to just keep, because I don't like processing something if I don't have to, so I'm just going to keep what I already had there. And then I'm done with the, this particular icon, so I'm just going to delete it. So here we are. I've got an unlinked set of color channels here. What I would like to do is get this kind of balance with them being linked, right? So I could do that with the background extraction. Uh, part of what I'm gonna do here though is I'm just gonna go through kind of my color calibration. So to start with, um, even on uh, a narrowband image, a lot of times it can be good to do a background neutralization because as you see, I still, have, I still feel like I've got a, a lot of green cast here. So I'm going to go ahead and make a little preview of just the background. It's really nice with these um, narrowband images because you end up with spots that actually are just not filled with stars as much as you get sometimes with the, the full color stuff. But then I just pick that preview as my background neutralization. And then just kind of the default options here, run it through. And now you can see everything kind of went to red. It's because it shifted all this here. If I, if I turn this back on to linked again and then run it, you can see now I've got this a little bit more in good shape. If I unlink it and run it, you know, it kind of is a subtle change there on the colors, right? But it, you know, it did kind of make sure that things were neutralized, especially if you got a little too much of one color, sometimes that can be helpful. And then we're gonna do color calibration here. On narrow bands, sometimes this is hit very hit or miss, um, but sometimes I like to run it just to see uh, what I'm going to get. So first thing is white reference for the image. Um, it doesn't mean it has to be white, but it's kind of saying what should have a good balance of colors in it. So I'm normally kind of picking the main area of the image here for that. So that's my preview number two. And then down here, the reference image for the background is that same preview number one that we just did the background neutralization on. And let's go ahead and run it and see what it does. Okay, so it did dim some things out, but that's okay because we're still not a stretch. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna link it now because it's balanced to those colors. Uh, I don't want the STF to try to rebalance them. So I'm gonna keep it linked and then run this and then what I can tell is that this green cast is really gone now. It's, it's a whole lot more diminished. Um, and the color in here still looks pretty vibrant and good between the channels. I'm getting still got a lot of detail. 
So in this case, I feel like, okay, I think this did a good job. You know, sometimes it is not so great and you end up kind of stretching the colors manually, especially if you're very low in signal in one channel or another. Uh, but in this case, it did a, did a pretty good job there. I feel pretty good about it. So close up color calibration. Um, now we get into doing deconvolution. And I'll be super honest here. I find that, that deconvolution, my mileage varies a lot image to image. And a lot of times it comes down to how good was my focus? How good was my tracking? If my stars are more elongated um, or bloated, then I tend to get better results with deconvolution. If things are pretty tight, um, like in this one, they actually look fairly tight. I am getting a little bit of trailing off to the edges here in the stars. I may get some value out of it here. Um, but to start with, with deconvolution, the first thing you want to do is protect your brightest stars because those can get kind of chewed up um, in deconvolution. So to do that, you do a star mask just straight on the image here. Um, if you want to get even tighter on protecting the stars you can kind of stretch your image first and then do a star mask or use um, you know other you know star masking tools like starnet plus plus um, or star i forget if they're two pluses or not but you can use those kind of tools to, to come up with it but by default i'll normally just use a standard kind of star mask on the non-stretched image just to try to grab the very very brightest stars because those are the ones that get chewed up the most here so i'm just going to make the star mask now i'm not going to apply it that gets applied a little bit later so i'm going to create the star mask and then uh, the next one would be a range mask so this is you want to try to you want to really only run deconvolution on your high signal areas running it on the background kind of creates a bunch of artifacts so the starting kind of points here are kind of uh, not as important. You'll, you'll kind of play around with them, but sorry. One thing that I, I meant to do here is in order to come up with a good range mask, you do want to have a stretched image. So I'm just going to make a quick copy of this just so that I can get a stretch on it. So open up a histogram transformation. And when you have a good stretch in here, then you can just drag that to here drag that back, cancel your auto stretch, and now I have a stretch on this. And I'm just doing this to create a range selector. Um, some people will just pull the luminance out and use that. You can do that too. Um, it just is personal preference. Um, so I wanna make sure that I'm getting my high signal areas here and not a lot of the background. And, and by default, this, this is pretty close. I'm just gonna play around with it a little bit just to see what that does. Well, that's bad. I don't want all that. That's not enough. So I definitely want to bring it back in. Just start playing with it until I feel like I'm in a happy medium. And that, that 0.35 was pretty good um, to begin with there. If I go back to it, the only thing I worry about is, is it capturing a little too much of this. So I'm, I actually kind of like that 0.36 just a little better. Okay. So once I've got that, run on this. Now I've got a range mask, and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to close up my copy. I really didn't need it uh, long term. So now I have my range mask. The range mask I will end up applying. And this is all the prep work for uh, for your deconvolution. And so when you apply the mask and it gives you that kind of window here, anything that is your actual image bleeding through, that's what it's going to work on. It is not going to work on the rest of this here. So I can tell my high signal areas are all caught in here. And then if I want to toggle off what the mask looks like, I can just say, don't show the mask. This is lower signal. You know, there's nothing to sharpen here, so to speak. So I feel like I'm in pretty good shape. I can tell the mask is on because I've got my little brown guy there. Um, so just doing some cleanup. I'll get those out of the way. And then we get into the point spread function. So we do deconvolution. You can do one that's kind of more 
automated one, and sometimes that can work well. But everything that I've seen has said uh, you get your best results by just putting the effort in to manually pick the stuff for this point spreads function. And all, all you're really doing is trying to figure out what an average star in this looks like does it look like an egg is it pointed off to the left or right is it perfectly round you know etc how big is it and so for that you're looking for not your super bright stars and not your super dimmest stars you're looking for stars that are more in the middle and so when you click on those you'll come in here and it's going to give you a value for each one of these right because you are looking at kind of the red green and blue of it um, and what I would say is, if I remember correctly, you don't want to actually run the deconvolution, the, the, the point spread function on the color part of the data here, right? So we're going to go ahead and remove this one out. We're going to extract our luminance layer with this button up here. So that's just going to give me the luminance part. So let me shrink this back down and go to just the luminance. And then I want to go through and basically pick a bunch of those kind of medium stars. So I don't want to pick something where there's two stars right on top of each other because it needs to be able to see one star at a time. And for each one of those there, here, I'm going to actually close this up and just restart it because it was showing both images in there. There we go. So when I pick this, it's going to do a description of how that star looks to it. Um, and it's going to say, you know, Moffat or a couple other ones. And the one that you don't want is Gaussian. Uh, Gaussian in general means it's the kind of spread profile of this. And Gaussian typically means this thing has gotten too big um, for deconvolution to work really well. So we'll go ahead and just start picking through here. So you can see I've got another Gaussian when I'm looking at that one. So that one's kind of too big. So we'll just start more in this range here. And basically I won't watch whether or not each one is a Gaussian or a Moffat. Now in this one, I got two stars in there, so that one's probably not a great target. Um, and we'll just go around and start clicking on these. And you really wanna get up to about 20 or 30 So this can be a process that can take some time. All right, so now I've got a bunch of stars selected here. So I probably have a good enough one to, to kind of take a look at. So the first thing I want to do is scroll back up through my list, find anything that's got Gaussian on it. I'm just going to hold down the control key as I select those. Those are all the wrong kind of profile for what I'm looking for. So anything I've got that's Gaussian, I then want to minus out. All right. And now I don't have any Gaussian anymore. And then I want to sort all this by the A, which is the amplitude. So I go down to the sort button, 
sort by amplitude. And then this, so now everything's sorted out by the amplitude. And from everything that I'm, I've been aware of, there's, there's definitely a rule of thumb of like what level of amplitude you want. Um, and I probably ought to go back to school on it a little bit more. But basically I found anything below 0.1 a lot of times ends up being too small for the process to work well. So I'll get rid of that. They got 0.1 and then anything that gets up to like 0.9 or something's also too big. So in here I'm between 0.3 and 0.1. Seems pretty good. I've got a decent amount. I've got, you know, 10 or so, 10 or 15 or so in here. The more you have, the, the better the average is, but this should be pretty good for here. And then you go and do the average PSF. So, oh, haven't selected them all. So do control A to select everything run this and then it comes up with the averages here hit the camera and now i have a little image of what my star looks like and so like i thought you know i've got a little bit of egg shape going on here they're not perfectly round um so that's good so now that i've got this for my little psf image i now have kind of the three images that you typically need uh, when running your deconvolution. I've got a star mass to protect my big stars. I've got a range mass to make sure I'm really only targeting this area and you know my stars, uh, my smaller stars. And then I've got the point spread function that tells everything, this is the way things look. And then it knows, okay, well, I'm trying to get something that's perfectly round. So it knows kind of how to undeform your image, so to speak. So now I can pull up deconvolution. And by default, it's because I'm using this external PSF, you know, it already knows, okay, I'm going to use the PSF image that I just saved. Um, and then looking at deringing, it's going to use the star mask to support the, the, the big stars to try to not mess with it. And then I've applied, now I'm looking at luminance right now, but I'll close this down to, to get back in the other one. I've applied my, uh, my range mask to the image itself. Now, so you can see it's targeting luminance. That's why I'm not just working on a luminance uh, on its own and then going to bring it right back in because it's targeting the luminance and as opposed to all the components. Uh, it should be essentially the same idea. Um, and then this can take a long time on a whole image. So you kind of want to run it on a preview. Um, luckily, my area that I'm looking at is small enough that I can kind of get the whole thing in a preview here. But if you're dealing with an image that's got it going, got your target going across the thing, just pick an area that's got some good detail, but can also show you some of the background. So you make sure everything's kind of working there. And then I would normally include a couple of relatively bright stars in there just to make sure if it looks like it's kind of chewing those up. So then let's go ahead and make sure that we're looking at our preview there. And then we're going to run this. And I just run it kind of by default with the settings that are in here uh, to start with and see what it gives me. Oh, well, that didn't look good, right? I've got a lot of, a lot of kind of bright fuzzies here. So that normally means I need to slightly tweak the global dark or global bright. So I'm going to start by going out one tick on this one and rerunning it even worse so definitely have an issue at that level so let's try doing half of this so oh five okay that's a little better and then I can kind of tweak back and forth and see what's going on so very very hard to see in here. I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit more. But what I'm getting is I'm getting these kind of bright spots in here. It doesn't feel like the way that you would normally want to see this working, which is almost like putting on a pair of glasses where things just look sharper. All it's really kind of doing is adding these kind of what they call the wormies uh, in here. So normally, that could mean you need to lower it down even more. So like instead of 0.05, let's say it's 0.03. Um, 
or maybe you need to bump up the global bright a little bit. Uh, I like I said, I haven't gone fully to school on all of this. Uh, I remember some of it. There's some things in here that that can make a little bit more sense if you deep dive into deconvolution. But yeah, it looks like I'm just getting a lot of that. So I'm gonna bump up the global bright just one, and let's see what difference that makes, if any. Uh, really rough. And you can tell when I'm looking, when you look at what rolls across here, you get a lot of divergence messages. And that normally means that you're running across an issue. You don't want to see those. So when I run it without that, I'm not getting those, which means it at least thinks it's working. Let me bump this up to 25. I just want to see if I was running this at a higher level, how bad that issue gets there. And it's about the same but it really isn't sharpening up much for me. It's just kind of brightening a few of these areas. And when I'm zoomed out, yeah, it really doesn't look like it's buying me much there. Um, and I'm sure there are more settings I could play around with, but this is what I've found is that sometimes it really helps and sometimes it really isn't doing much for me. In this case, it just doesn't seem to be doing much for me, so I'm gonna ditch it. And I think it's okay to do that I think it's okay to leave it in the video right of you know sometimes you know if a process doesn't work don't beat your head up against the wall with it right try it a few times if it doesn't work move on um, you know maybe go back to school on it later for another image you're gonna do that kind of thing in this case I'm gonna go ahead and remove my mask as well as I don't want it to kind of stop me from working uh, and then we go into noise reduction so noise reduction, I've, I've kind of covered before, but I'll, I'll kind of go through it here again as part of this process. Um, so noise reduction, obviously you want to apply to the background more so than your signal area. Um, and to do that, you want to create a mask. You can use a, uh, a stretched luminance layer as a mask. That can be a good one. Um, you can use a range mask. There's also a really nice feature built in to the multi-scale linear transform for making the mask. And that's the one that I've really started using the most lately. So you want to turn that on, click preview mask. You want to turn off your auto stretch because it's gonna kind of make it seem wrong if you have it auto stretch when you do it. And then you click your preview button. And you can either leave it inverted or take it off either way uh, you know you're just it just depends on how you best think about the mask right um, if it's inverted essentially anything that's black is what it's gonna work on and the white it won't work on if it's inverted you know anything that's approaching white it will work on stronger so I'm gonna leave it inverted here for now um, and then you're just playing with the amplification so if I had this really high at 300 it's just basically multiplying my linear image over and over again, right? Um, if I had it down at one, because it's a linear image, there's only a couple little dots for stars that are bright enough there. So you just got to kind of play around with at what level am I really getting it? And so you can see here, yeah, I've got a couple areas that are kind of turned into black here, but a lot of this is only getting worked on in a couple of color channels. And that may not be good enough. That may blur out some of your stuff a little more than you like. So just kind of tweak it around until you feel like your actual detail areas are really getting hit well enough. You know, and if it's too much, it's like this, then you know you're kind of in trouble. You're going to get a lot of spotty working in your background. So it's really just kind of playing that game of at what point am I kind of maximum hitting my background. You know, the background is the most like white or black, depending on how you have the mask set up versus protecting those high signal areas. So this is getting pretty close. Go to 250. Yeah, I think I like this one. You know, my filaments are all pretty heavily hit for the stuff that's white, and then the stuff that's the different colors is really protected for just that color, but my background is 
pretty open to getting hit. So all that seems good. So now, and close the preview. I'll go ahead and re-auto stretch my image here. Um, and then I'm going to turn off the preview box. So now I get my noise reduction on here. And now, once again, I can just open up my preview of what I had and go ahead and just apply this with the settings that I have here. And there you go. So you can see the background got hit really well. And then just toggling back and forth here. You know, what I'm looking for, first of all, is these high signal areas, are they changing at all? I kind of don't want those high signal areas to change in the slightest. And it looks like they're not. That's good. But then there are areas like this, right, that have color, but there's a lot of noise in that color. And I'd like that to get smoothed out. And in general, it looks like they are. I'm getting a little bit of graininess in here because maybe it you know isn't hitting it as much as I'd like or maybe it's hitting it a little too much that kind of thing. So maybe I want to back off this just a little bit. Let's bring it down to 200. Yeah. Let's see if we like that better. All right, I think I feel like my graininess at the edges is less, which is good. Now I'm kind of watching in these areas here where I have some of the, the signal that I like that I don't want to have go away. And specifically, I'm paying attention to little jagged areas, right? Little areas where there's some definition to it. Do those seem like they're getting killed by this noise reduction? I don't think they are. I think they're staying pretty good tabbing back and forth here. So I think that's actually pretty good. Yeah, I think I like that. So now I'm going to go ahead and apply that to the whole image. All right, and then I can, once again, up here now, kind of tab back and forth and see. Once again, on YouTube, always going to be hard to see that noise reduction at the high level, so I'll kind of bring it back in here. And that's it before and after. So target still looks pretty good. I don't think I'm really killing too much in my detail. All right, so I think I'm going to keep that. So that is noise reduced linear image. Now we're ready to go ahead and stretch this bad boy. And this, especially in narrow band, can be where you spend a lot of time playing, right? Because this is not true color. And if it's not true color, that means the color is entirely up to you. If you don't like hydrogen being green, then don't make your hydrogen green when you combine the channel. Make it red if you want, right? If you didn't get a lot of S2 data, maybe you just do HOO. Uh, you know, put the O in two channels to make a false color or combine colors together. You can play around with all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then when you're stretching it, sometimes maybe, like let's say for example, I wanted this blue, which in this would be my, my, my S data. Maybe I want my S2 data to really pop more, right? Well, I can do that if I wanted to. You know, if I drag this up in here, turn off the auto stretch so I can kind of see this, I could come to the blue channel and pull it a little bit more if I wanted to and try to try to amp it up you know the trick is if you want to keep your colors balanced you know if you're gonna pull one of them up then you may need to bring it back down to kind of get your colors more in alignment um, but it gets kind of tough when you're doing the doing it at the first stretch point so a lot of times what you may want to do is just start with your simple auto stretch by the way, it's one thing that happens. If you do an auto stretch after you've noise reduced, it kind of goes nuts. So if I ever need to do that, I'll back it up one more step, auto stretch it, then punch it forward. Um, but normally it's, uh, the auto stretch is going to push this background a little too much. So I'll normally start with leaving it all linked. I'll put the little cursor on here, 
drag this down a bit so that my background doesn't feel overstretched. And I'll use this kind of thing as, as my first initial stretch. So let's do this here. Put it back on RGB for everything. Pop it over. Now I've got a stretched image. And now if I wanted to, I can play around with the peaks here. So let's say I wanted that blue to be better. I can kind of pull the blue forward a bit and then bring it back. So it's a little more stretched. What I'm trying to do is line that peak back up, right? And so when looking at this here, before I pulled that peak back up, oh, need the preview on, sorry. So before I pulled that peak back up, the, the background's gone very blue now, right? And if I bring this back, now my background gets more in line, but you can tell the actual object itself got a lot more blue, right? Uh, and you can do that with each color channel for, you know, kind of just to taste, right? Um, in this case, let's say I wanted the red a little bit more. Actually, let's start with saying I wanted everything a little bit more. So I want to bring this up, but I want my background to be kind of low. I don't want to chewed up background either. Because that, that, that's the danger, right, when you overstretch. You end up with something that looks like this, where you have this kind of big blotchy background. So a lot of times I will err on the side of having a dimmer image, um, but one that feels cleaner. But you can see as I stretch this up, you can see how much of this, this is the count of how many pixels or what percentage of my image is being clipped to just straight black. And a lot of times you kind of don't want to have that happen too much. So let's say I wanted my peak at about here. Just kind of using this guide as a marker here. I want my peak about there. But maybe I'd like my red to be a little bit higher. So now I'm going to come into just the red, move it up, and then bring it down right on that line again. And so you can see kind of the, kind of the difference there. It does make a difference in your background because you are kind of stretching that a little bit harder. So you may need to tweak it just ever so slightly. If you want to do that, you can always, I think, background new, neutralize it again if you want to. Uh, and then you can always just jump the preview back and forth to see what you like. In my case, because I had such strong data in all three channels to begin with, I'm actually not going to mess with it too much. I'm going to kind of leave it as is there. Uh, but I will kind of do an overall, brighten it up just a little bit. You know, I want to make sure any kind of auto stretch is off because I'm not going to mess with that anymore. And then some things like LRGB combination, mass stretch, I'm kind of doing that more when I have literally like a luminance layer that I'm working with. In this case, because the color is so different in all three and I didn't do a crazy amount of work on a, on a luminance target, uh, I'm not going to mess with it too much here. The next thing that I'm really going to look at here is the HDR multi-scale transform. So this can be really good when you've got very bright parts of your image and very dark parts of your image. It just kind of will even things out, especially on like the core of a galaxy where maybe after your stretch, it's very, very bright and you, you feel like you're losing some detail. This can help bring some of it back. Um, once again, this is a, a to taste tool. So sometimes it'll work well, sometimes it won't. Um, but bring it over here on the preview. This target, I'll be interested to see how much it really does. Um, but let's let's take a look at it. So the default is kind of six layers on this. Layers are the scale that it's working at, right? So if you have a lot of very small fine detail in your image, then six may be a really good way to go. However, if you have, what you may find is that that chews it up, makes it, it kind of gives it too many holes or something in it uh, when you run it, in which case you might want to increase the layers to seven or eight. I find that for almost all of my images, between six and eight is as far as I normally want to go. 
and I normally don't mess with the other options here. So let's go ahead and run it here with six. And there we go. So jumping back and forth here, you can see it's essentially kind of almost dehazed this center part and allowed some of this, this kind of wispy detail to really, really stand out a little bit more, which is, is pretty nice. Um, but let's, let's try it with the eight. And so what we can do to compare this very easily is if you have one there, you can actually just drag this tab off and kind of make a little little image to the side of that preview. And then let's run it again with eight. And then we can kind of side by side them. All right, and so there's eight, which eight really kind of almost popped this out almost to white a little bit more. I think the scale on this may be a little little funky for this particular target. Um, but so let's pull that one out. So that's the eight down here, and that's the six. And then to show you what it looks like if you're kind of really off the rails, let's go down to four. Actually, that kind of came out not too bad on the four. But let's, here, let's, I want to try to find something that's really kind of out there. All right, so there we go. So this one obviously at 12 is not doing what I want it to do. And you can see if you watch this star, by the way, it gets chewed up like crazy. So a lot of times when you run this, uh, HDR process, you'll want to put like a star mask on to make sure that you're not going to, to be messing your stars up too much. Um, and I may do that at the very end here uh, before I run it. But 12 is way too much. Six wasn't bad. Let's let's look at four. I normally do it two at a time because it helps me narrow in um, on what I'm doing there. So let's do four again. And then I want to really kind of compare the three of these here. So that's the four. Let's and so which of these three do we like better? I feel like the eight is just washing things out too much. So we're just going to scratch that entirely here. Now it's between this one and this one. And the differences are pretty subtle. Let me blow both of these up as much as they're probably even a little too big there. I can zoom out a bit. All right. So between these two here, very very close but I think I like the six just a little bit better than the four and just looking at that star there it doesn't seem to be getting chewed up the way it was when I, I really had the thing set around so I think I like the six better so long way around the block but sometimes you gotta do that to see which one makes your prettiest picture so let me just blow this back up to size and then we'll just double check that we're looking at this all right. Yep, still looks good. So let's apply that to the whole image. This always takes a minute and then half the time it'll kind of bail me out of the app and I click back in. All right, there we go. So now we have this whole thing done. Let's just double check that it seemed to work. Yep, a very subtle change, right? But it just feels like some of that haze that was in here just disappears out. And then just doing a quick scan of my stars to see if anything looks rough. 
And it looks like this is really my brightest star down here. So if I'm going to get chewed up, it's going to be on that one. It looks good. It looks good. What I'm looking to see is, is the core here not even? Does it look like there's a dot in the center? And it doesn't look like it. Although sometimes you can kind of go blind trying to look at that stuff. But so that's HDR transform. Then we have local histogram equalization. They're kind of working in similar areas, but it's all about trying to balance the detail versus the brightness. So I can run this at the, the 50 to start with. Um, actually, let's again do it on the preview. And so once again, pretty subtle, but you can tell it's kind of brightening up some of this just subtly. And then typically running it back with running it again with 150. So it's more of it's looking at small detail first and then doing a pass that's looking at the large detail. All right. And so kind of do the two passes. So I was doing that on the previews. So let's start here with the 50 on this so we can kind of see the full difference. So that kind of does single pass there at the small level and then at the higher level. And there we go. So if I step this back, so this is before I did any of it, first pass, second pass. And so you can see it's kind of just popping you know, both the, the overall kind of bigger parts of the structure and the little parts of the structure without me having to do some curves on it, which I will get to, but this kind of helps separate this out a little bit more from the background pieces. And so then, you know, speaking of which, we go into curves. So I always turn on the little tracker so I can kind of see my, where my peak is. And we'll open up the preview here. And then it's just a question of what do you like, all right? There's the standard kind of S curves where you're trying to, to bring stuff out. What I find is that a lot of times we go too far off the bat, right? So what I'll normally start with on an S curve is just very subtle changes. You know, right now I feel like my background, which if I click on it, I can see is about here, is a little too bright. So I'm gonna just kind of drag down to bring that background a little bit more into the black and then this, which you can tell depending on which part I'm clicking on, kind of runs the range from the middle of that peak up towards the top. So I'm really just looking for subtle changes to try to bring that out. But because some of that, some of this in here is actually below my dot, I may want to bring my dot down a little bit so that I can have a little bit more pull out of that on the thing here. And you just kind of play around very, very subtly with it. Because after you've done your main stretch, a lot of what you're doing after that is just going to start bringing things more and more to white. Um, or in this case, starting to make it feel a little not real. And But it's all personal preference at that point. You know, maybe, you know, you like it a little bit, little bit brighter. You really like having that super dark background. All of that is, is perfectly fine. Um, but you can kind of play around with that to taste there. Actually, I'm going to leave that top one alone. I just want to play around with the background for a minute. I feel really good with the background kind of where it is there, I think. Um, but I know I've dipped a lot of that other stuff. So I'm going to drag this back to the middle point. And I'm just going to take a look at where we are there. And a lot of times what I, what I end up with is a lot of times I, I'm actually okay with the brightness of this. It's this that I want dimmer. So kind of flipping between them, I can kind of see, okay, am I dimming my main object or am I dimming it too much? And how's the background reacting? So in this case, it's almost like just dimming this and not messing with that too much. That's not bad. I think I probably like this a little brighter. So 
turn that back on and then this curve will I'll bring it up just a bit not a crazy amount and there we go and I feel like that's doing a pretty good job without this all turning too much to white So once you like that, you can play around with this for hours and hours and hours, trying to get it just right. There we go. Um, yeah, I think I did make it a little too white. So I'm going to back it up one step. Go back in, because I haven't met, messed with this, I can actually adjust this down a hair. I think that's I think that's better and now I'll do this one okay yeah I like that one better so there we go before and after on that um, and that's looking looking pretty good uh, next one would be saturation sometimes you can use the saturation tool on its own I actually like the curves tool on its own a little bit better so you know with that you can come in here and really play around with that saturation and kind of bump it you know if you bump it way up it gets kind of way crazy you know way down you know it can be kind of crazy the other way right um, but once again this is all to taste it's all fake color at this point right it's all false color so what false color do you like a lot of times I like a little bit more saturated color. Sometimes I go overboard with it. Um, and then you can just kind of tab back and forth. It's crazy subtle differences um, like a lot of this stuff. But I'm going to bump it just a hair, just a scotch to give a little bit more color in there. And then we get into our sharpening side. So multi-scale linear sharpening or transform you can use it as a sharpening tool as well um, you know I've done this shown this in kind of other things but basically you're not clicking on the noise reduction instead you're you're giving more weight to the different levels uh, and once again levels are the size of the things in the image so at the smaller levels you're dealing with your finer detail so if you want to sharpen up you can basically give a little bit more bias to these first few levels and nothing added on the other ones so running this this is kind of my general kind of sharpening settings here which for anyone that wants to kind of copy them kind of show you it goes 0 0.38 0 0.25 0 0.25 0 0.12 so you see we're sharpening the most at scale 2 then a little bit less for four and eight so it kind of smooths as it's going and then just a little bit on that last level at uh, last layer at, at 16. so and when we run this you know hopefully you can see i'll jump it in just a little bit here and then jump it back and forth you know it's very subtle and it isn't like an unsharp mask that a lot of times creates artifacts this is just popping those pieces of it a little bit more. Just gonna leave that like that. Then I also have an unsharp mask on here. Sometimes that's worth it, sometimes it's not. You know, I'll kind of pull it and play with it just to see if do I like it or do I not. In this case, I think maybe I'm probably over sharpening it at that point, so I'm just going to leave that off. Um, and then we have morphological transformation. This is star reduction. Um, and it's really going to depend on your target as to how much you want to do. Um, I kind of have it at the, the these kind of default settings here. or not, They're not default for it, but these are my default settings. You can kind of apply it and see. And just you know take a look at did that one do you like that level of reduction maybe you do maybe you don't and then two how much did it chew up your object right so you can see here there's a decent amount that kind of came out on this that it's maybe chewing into my detail a little bit too much so maybe not two iterations maybe I'll do one iteration And 
can kind of play with that. And that's that's the, the default side. The other side that you can do is now that this is a stretched image, you could also run and create a star mask on it. And some targets are better on that than others. Sometimes Galaxy will have a little trouble with the star mask and, and it'll catch too many pieces of it. We'll see what it looks like here. Because I want to reduce those stars, but I don't want to chew up all this fine detail. And that morphological transformation can certainly do that. With the big wispy nebula, you may not notice it enough to really have to worry about trying to do the mask first. All right. Okay, that's not too bad. I still got some of this in there, but mainly it's looking at the stars. Let's see how well this works here. So I'm gonna put my star mask on. And I wanna make sure I'm, I can see the mask, make sure I'm looking at the right things. Yep, so I just wanna attack those stars there. It's got a little bit of the nebula in there, but hopefully that won't do too much. So let's stop showing the mask, and now let's run this back at the two. All right, and what I'm really looking for here, because I know this is going to reduce the stars themselves. I'm not too worried about that. Once again, just looking at that detail in the center there. And while, yeah, it did come down a little bit in these brightest, brightest areas, I think that's actually close enough for me. I don't feel like it really did a lot of damage there. And when I zoom out and look at what it did to the stars, you know, oh, sorry, what it did to the stars, I can tell it really dimmed them out quite a bit. Um, just double checking my steps that I was on here. Yep, yeah. okay. Yeah, so it dimmed them out quite a bit there. And, you know, this is the before, and that's the after. And just, just minimized them down enough that the target itself stands out a little bit more. Um, and now we're, we're getting close to being done, right? Um, Autohistogram is a process that I, I picked up learning somewhere else. Um, here, let me take the mask off. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it just kind of depends on my image. So, I'm, you know, I kind of leave it with these default values in here and I just kind of like to see what it comes up with in this case I don't like that that brought my background way too up so if I don't like it I don't use it SCNR so I've got a lot of kind of greenish stars in here and you'll always get kind of weird colored stars uh, whenever you're working with narrow band so sometimes a little bit of an SCNR can help but at the same point in time it may end up chewing my back my uh, my actual image too much here. So let's see. So definitely help the stars, but then if you notice, my colors got very different here. Um, and this is something that you gotta kind of find out for yourself on where you like your colors. Some people like that kind of green from the HA, but especially if you've got a predominantly HA target, the green may be overpowering in which case you may want to slightly adjust those colors as you go. So in this case, I want to get rid of my green stars. Don't really want to mess with that too much. Well, goody goody, I made a star mask, right? So I'm going to apply my star mask again. Let me double check, make sure once again that it's kind of just targeting the stars there. And let's see what that does now. So now when I ran it, I was just looking at this here. So jumping back, yeah, my main target didn't really change. I can see a couple of slight color changes, but when I'm looking at the stars, they changed a lot. So I'm gonna come down here and look at this bad boy. My brightest star out here kind of looks like a little bit of a sickly yellow pale green run the thing on it, and hey, that looks almost like a true color star now, right? That looks pretty good. And across the image, I see the same kind of thing. Once again, it's super subtle at the full zoom out level, but it just takes that, that green cast kind of out of there, um, which, is, which is really, really nice. 
So overall, I like it. I like it a lot. Um, and at any point in time, I could always come back in on curves if I wanted to and start doing things like playing around with um, the greens and the colors. So there's one thing I didn't show on here that I really should uh, because I do it a lot on the targets where that green or something like that does become overpowering. So we remove the mask here. It's a great process, a great script under utilities called color mask. And when you run that, you pick which color you want to mess with. So let's say it's the green that I'm really not happy with for the object itself. Pick that, click OK. And then it's going to create a mask that is just targeting that. Apply it as is. And here, let me get rid of these previews. So they're not in the way. And then when I pull up, say, curves, anything I'm doing here, let's say I was just looking at everything and I want to dim stuff out, anything I'm looking at is just in just being applied to those greens. So it really allows you to select those colors. And where that gets really powerful is with these kind of hue sliders here, you know, green to red or blue to yellow. And so when I start dragging this, and I'll exaggerate it here, right? But I start dragging it more towards the red and you see the green really just the tint of it just changes pretty pretty well there, and it can go a very big swing. And likewise, if I want to move it more towards the green, maybe it's kind of a sickly green before, and I want to make it a deeper kind of green. Basically, you're just kind of switching those sliders. And so a lot of times you'll get this kind of kind of look here where you're really kind of moving that green a little bit more one way or another. Now, in my case, I really kind of like the multicolor effect here, and I don't find the green to be overpowering the whole image. So I might actually even deepen it just a little bit to have a little bit darker green. So apply that in. I don't feel too bad because I already fixed the stars, right? So the stars aren't getting any sicklier. Um, but I'll do the same thing. Let me remove the mask on this one. I'm going to do the same thing on a color mask for uh, for the blue. The blue, the blues, and the greens are typically and teal sometimes are the ones I tend to hit the most. So you can see my blue is just kind of my outer fringe edge here. And then in this case, I'm going to mess, oops, sorry, I have the mask selected. In this case, I'm going to use the blue to yellow kind of one. And then I just want to start moving it. If you can see, you know, it's kind of almost fading out there. I think because it's kind of going more. Not sure if it's going more towards the blue or the yellow on that. Let's go the other way. Yeah, it was definitely going more towards the yellow in there. Uh, and you don't want to be too drastic because what's up happening is when you zoom in, you can see these really hard lines uh, from the mask. So I just want to deepen my blues a little bit there um, and maybe even bring up Just want to bump up the brightness overall for the blue just a little bit. That's probably even a little too much. And then let's look. Oh yeah, I like that. So now pop that in and my blue outline starts to stand out a little bit more, right? And that's kind of what I was going for there. I liked kind of the red where it was, kind of like deepening the green a little bit, want the blue to stand out a little bit more. And all I'm doing is selecting the color and kind of bumping it up, changing the hue a little bit, 
once again, it's all false color, so who cares, right? You know, as long as you're happy with how that image looks on there, then you're in pretty good shape. And so I've kind of gone through those. Uh, clone tool, super um, uh, situational if you've got like a weird artifact that you need to stamp out. Uh, XPTR, this exponential transformation using the, the power of inverted pixels. This is just a little trick that got picked up somewhere. Sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. And it can kind of give you a little boost. Sorry, I'm doing, looking, still got the mask on. Sometimes it can give you a little boost in, in pop um, that can be nice. Um, you know, once again, it's to taste. Do you like the little extra pop or not? Um, in my case, yeah, I think I like it. So I'm going to leave it on there. Um, fast rotation, if you need to rotate it around, is that one. Pixel math is good to just kind of have together. Um, it's kind of just a default setting there. But if you need to, need to do something like... Uh, you know, combine different colors together. Sometimes pixel math is just handy to have on there. And the RGB working space was a holdover from a particular project. And this one I need to, these two I just need to get rid of. I don't use them anymore at all. But that's, so that's really it. Um, the, the last bit on this, as I can tell, I'm still a little bright on my background from where I'd like it to be. So I might do just a final curves just to kind of bring the background down but not have this get too dark uh, that started chewing into my background here too much so I want to bring that down and bring this down because I think I'd like this to stay about where it is and that to stay about where it is and let's see what that did. It did help a bit. Make it even darker. Without killing stuff, or am I starting to chew? Maybe starting to chew just a little bit there. So let's let you come down just a hair. I think that's a good compromise without losing too much that's in here. Yep. So we'll call that our final curve. And now it's time to save this guy. And you should be saving as you go anyways, right? But uh, in this case, I'll save an XS XISF uh, just so that I have the whole thing. at the 32 bit and then I'm an over saver so I'll also save it as a TIFF file and I'll do that as a 16 bit TIFF so it works really well in Photoshop and then I'm lastly going to save it as a PNG for sharing out there in the world And then typically I'll come in here and just kind of verify that things are looking the way I would want. And there's my final image. You know, it's not perfect. Uh, I could have spent some more time on it um, doing a lot of different things, but uh, just, just playing around with all those same dials more and more, right? Uh, the background is probably the thing that I, I feel like I could do better with overall. Probably could have used another round of noise reduction or, or TGV denoise or something like one of those other processes that, that can be a little bit more situational. But overall, came out really good. I'm really happy with the color. The detail pops well, you know, especially since I was taking this on my refractor. Uh, telescope. This is before, you know, my recent SCT that would let me kind of have this as kind of a more native field of view on it. Um, you know, pretty happy with this. You know, I like how this one turned out. So hopefully this is helpful for you uh, as you're starting to process through your own narrowband sets of data. Um, 
you know, there's some advanced techniques that I, I didn't go through, like, you know, really doing full star extraction and, and working with the detail levels here. But that's that's really kind of getting into the more advanced and, and time consuming pieces of this. So for your, your straightforward narrowband processing, I hope this can be kind of a helpful guide for you on, on what's worked for me. Um, like anything else I do, if you're going through something and it isn't working, ditch that process. Skip, try a different one, watch a video that maybe deep dives into that particular process to help you out. So that's it for this time. I hope everybody uh, had a good one, good time with this one. And until next time, I wish everybody clear skies. Thanks.